Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, and thank you, Walter, uh, for those kind words. And thank you, Madam Secretary, for uh, spending some time with us. The Secretary and I are going to go uh, 40 minutes, plus or minus. Uh, and then we'll leave some room for questions from the floor. Um, Got to have you out of here by 9 o'clock. So we're going we're to move pretty swiftly. And I want to start with you, if I might, with the phone call you got. Walter alluded to this. The phone call you got either from the president or from Dennis McDonough, the chief of staff, that said, hey, listen, Kathleen Sebelius is leaving. What are you doing for the next couple of years? Do you want to run HHS? And let's remember, this is when healthcare got dove. It had some problems. And it was a tricky time. And you said, what? I said, are you sure you got the right person? Um, it, you know, at that point in time, I had come back to the Office of Management and Budget, which made so much sense, you know, in terms yeah. of, for me, loving budget issues, having worked at the Treasury, having been at the Office of Management and Budget. We had actually just gotten our first deal done. We'd gotten rid of, uh, you know, after the shutdown, I'd, you know, we worked on that yeah. and everything, and so I was excited about the progress we were going to make, both from a budget perspective and a management perspective. So it was a bit of a, a surprise mm -hmm. uh, when I did get that call. But um, after I got that call and, and understood, you know, what the president and the team were thinking, you know, I was excited by the opportunity and the challenge because I really believe, and I'm sure we're going to talk about this evening. Healthcare is at an incredibly important transitional moment in our nation. And if I could go and contribute in some way to that, I was excited to be able to do that. This is a totally inside baseball question. Honest personal curiosity. When you're going to get a cabinet secretary job, does the president actually call? <laughs> well, the president is engaged in the process. But the conversations <laughs> start with others because I'm not going to use the president's time. Right, if, uh, but yes, no, the president is deeply engaged and. Uh, certainly, when I first came to OMB, yeah. uh, I'd never met the president. So that oh, process really? uh, was a process that started, hmm. you know, those conversations actually started with him because he needed to, you know, we needed to meet each right, other. Right, right, so. totally. Uh, you are the manager of a giant bureaucracy uh, in an intensely political environment. How do you do your job every day? You know, um, it is, uh, it, both of those things are, are, are true. Um, HHS is $1.1 trillion uh, and has 10 operating divisions. So it, it's a very large uh, department, um, certainly actually financially larger than DOD, but not as much in terms of people. And the partisan back and forth is something that is challenging. However, one of the things that I believe and consistently believe is that there's a place for common ground no matter how difficult the issues and that sort of thing. I believe that uh, a couple things from a management perspective. One is prioritization, you know, figuring out what are the key things you mm -hmm. need and want to accomplish. The other is actually focusing on impact versus outcomes. You know, Explain the, the difference. So outcomes I consider um, the, the thing that is an outcome. It is a measurable thing, but it is not actually how something gets changed. So for instance, if you were thinking about uh, working in uh, the area of food and agriculture and that sort of thing, or maybe even food and the hungry, giving people the sandwiches, it's the difference between teach a man to fish. And so the outcome is much more, instead of giving a man a fish, teaching a man to fish. And so focusing on that, and then the third thing, and I think this is probably the most important to the current context mm -hmm. is, um, I have evolved and learned, hopefully over time, the importance of relationships. And in a town where there's a lot of partisan um, back and forth, just actually placing value on the importance of relationship and respect for others, including those you deeply disagree with. And that's something that I think has been a very important part uh, of my time at HHS and has helped uh, in terms of the work. When you um, go to the Hill and uh, you are uh, given oversight from various uh, congressional committees, um, do you get the sense that there is a community of spirit of we would like to have health care for American people? You know, I think that the Affordable Care Act is a completely unique um, part of the portfolio of HHS in terms of how politicized it is. And it is very difficult to move the conversation from three words, you know, huh. Affordable Care Act, or some use another phrase, Obamacare, 
um, to the substance of the issue. And that is a place that I think is harder than many of the other issues that I work on on a day-to-day -day basis, whether that's Ebola or a number of the issues of the department, um, opioids in terms of all the work that we do in that space. And so this is a place where it is particularly and uniquely hard. However, the place in is a place where reforming the healthcare system, you can sometimes have the conversation. So as you think about um, your, the, the total spectrum of what it is you do, mm -hmm. do you wind up spending a disproportionate amount of time on the ACA? Um, you know, sir, during my time, and so I've really only been at HHS for a little over right. two years. Right. So I got there, I was confirmed June 9th of 2014, uh, to give you a sense of it. It's been a relatively short period of time. And the question of disproportionality, we've had a number of crises. In addition, I think probably, and when I went over to take this job, I thought the answer to that question would be yes, hands yeah. down. And Easy. it still is yes, but at HHS during my time there, we have had Ebola, we have had Zika, we have had 50,000 unaccompanied children that came across the border from southern countries, across the United States southern border, and those children come to the care of HHS. Hmm. And so there have been a number of issues that probably also have taken disproportionate time. But certainly, I do spend a lot of time on uh, the Affordable Care Act, and that's both the issues of access affordability and quality, because that's what the act was about. And so spend time on all of that. Uh, so I want to dig into the ACA here a little bit, and then we'll move on to some other stuff, because you know your, your portfolio uh, is global. What is the biggest thing yet undone in your eyes to get the ACA to where the Obama administration wants it to be? So interestingly, I would answer that question with the biggest thing that needs to be done is to get to the place where we can do what you just asked about in your first que that the question, previous question, which is getting the place where we can actually have a dialogue about how to improve, about how to build on, because that's a conversation that has not been had in Washington. And with that conversation will come things. There will come big things and small things. So small things. The definition of Native American is not correct in, in the Affordable Care Act. It's different in different places, and that causes a lot of implementation problems. Even small <laughs> things like that, we haven't been able to fix. There are what I would call larger things. The tax subsidy for small businesses mm -hmm. is probably not large enough for those small businesses to do uptake, and so we've proposed that for a number of years, but hasn't taken. And then there's sort of the very big issues. And in the United States in healthcare, there are markets where you do not have a lot of competition of providers, in other words, doctors and others, and then you don't have competition of insurers, and that existed before the Affordable Care Act. And there's been some progress in that space, but that's a big space that you'd wanna focus on with a dialogue about how do we solve some of these issues, especially in rural America, or in places like Alaska, where there's not a lot of competition or therefore a lot of services for the people. How much of what you have left to do is, in essence, a marketing job, an outreach job, to make sure that the 10 plus million people who are not yet in the exchanges or covered somehow get there? Because it, it's not possible that they're not seeing the message, right? So I think that the, the job has, there are two parts of this that are left undone. Uh, and the one is you know, how to get the change. There are three things, how to get the changes, right. and that's what I just spoke to. The marketing issue, interestingly, I think is actually as much about making sure people understand the broad benefits of the ACA, and let me be specific. I feel pretty certain that everyone in this audience knows somebody with asthma or who has had cancer or some other pre-existing condition, and only since the Affordable Care Act, do you not need to worry if you're ever going to have a moment where you would go from one job to another and perhaps have a break in that coverage? Because pre-existing conditions no longer can keep you out of insurance. In this audience, I'm looking and I'm seeing probably actually about 50% female. No longer can we be charged, can I be charged more than you can be charged for our insurance policies. No longer, if you go, and whether it's you know, all the preventative services that no longer require a co-payment or additional payments. And all of those benefits to the marketing issue you're mm -hmm. raising, 
many people don't recognize or understand. Or, you know, I've met the kid who at the age of 19 had hit their lifetime limits because they had very severe cancer. Can you imagine? You're 19, and because you have, like, survived cancer, you have hit your lifetime limit of insurance. You can't be insured. And so no more lifetime limits, no more annual limits. The benefits broadly, and I think that is a part of the marketing, is making sure that people understand that. The second part is there's more substance to be done in the areas of access, affordability, and quality. In access, we, have, you know, we still have people as much progress. In the nation, it's historic. Those 20 million mean that for the first time in our country, under 10% of the people are uninsured, but there's more progress. 31 uh, states have expanded Medicaid, but there's more. Uh, we have another open enrollment that'll start November 1st to try and make sure we enroll mm -hmm. more folks. In the areas of affordability and quality, I think people still struggle. While costs have grown slower, so we've had the slowest price growth in healthcare that we've had in 50 years, we've seen Medicare per capita costs grow more slowly than we've seen. And in the employer-based market, four out of five of the slowest growth years on record in terms of premiums that employers, employees pay are the slowest, but there's more to be done there. And that is a part of the work that we'll do over the next six months. Speaking of six months, that's about all you got. That's it. Right? We, all we, she are, wrote. we are facing the first change of government, uh, uh, occupant of the White House for sure, and, and you know, we'll take the rest of it when it comes. Um, <laughs> Since this act was passed six years ago, um, uh, Paul Ryan now has the first sort of comprehensive Republican proposal. It's not a full plan, but it's a proposal. Um, how confident are you that this act will remain the healthcare marketplace that clearly the president and you hope it will be for the foreseeable future? So for six years, and I think you know, what Mr. Ryan um, put out recently is an outline. It can't be scored or measured in terms of its impact because there aren't numbers you know, mm -hmm. affiliated with it. And for six years, you know, that has been the situation in terms of that. And so the question, I think, comes to is this going to stand and stay, I mm -hmm. think is at the root yeah. of your question. And this is in the fabric of the nation at this point. For the 20 million people who have insurance that didn't have it before, the idea that you're going to take that away and what that means, I think, is a, a question in terms of those people are depending on that health care. Um, the question of all those benefits that I just want, do we want to go to a place where pre-existing conditions can keep you out of insurance? Do we want to go to a place where you know, we can have differentials in pricing based on gender? Do we want to go to a place where we're not encouraging prevention because you know, we're not doing certain types of wellness visits or screenings? And I just think we're not going back. Right. And this is why it's so important to connect the conversation okay. to the substance. All right, but, but let me, just because he's not around here right now, let me offer sort of what Paul Ryan might say, right? We've got health insurance premiums that are rising. We have the government too deeply in American health care. Uh, we have a, a system which uh, keeps the government in my health care, get it out, uh, let me do what I want. So this is one of the things that is most amazing about the conversation. It is a private market. The marketplace is a private market. Private insurers offer insurance and people pay for it. The government the role of the government in the marketplace, which is what mm -hmm. this part of this conversation is, is, is about. Is to set up the marketplace, just to channel Paul Ryan. What we do is we set up a place where can consumers can do something that they've never been able to do in the individual market. They can shop. And they can shop with transparency, with plans that have basic requirements of what the plans will have. Things like, oh, wait, these plans need maternity benefits. Can you imagine buying a health care, a health insurance plan that, and then you get pregnant and you find out it didn't have maternity? I mean, that could have happened and did happen before. And so the question of the private market, the way the system actually was set up is these are all private insurers' plans. The role of the government is to create affordability. And that's what the tax subsidies do. And when you take one step back, many of you in this room, I assume, have employer-based insurance. Well, you're subsidized, too, because there's a tax benefit that's occurring to your employer mm -hmm. because they're providing that insurance. And so it's a continuum of the question of how and where people, anybody here on Medicare, 
That's subsidized health insurance in the United States. And so this is a piece to create that continuity. Uh, I want to talk about um, how you're addressing the quality of care and this idea of pay for performance in the healthcare system today versus pay uh, for services. Do you think that that has actually taken hold and is, and is elemental now? I think uh, it is taking hold. Uh, so that I would, would be not, not uh, yet then. Uh, I, that would be we are in process and making progress, but I wouldn't say taken. And it is essential. So we are going to, in the next 10 years or so, to see a fundamental change in the way healthcare is delivered in our country. And so what we see is we're going to have an engaged and empowered consumer at the center. It will work much more like a market where a consumer has power. And one of the biggest things we can do is the payment change. And right now, the system in the United States is fee for service. So we pay for tests. We don't pay for the outcome, coming back to that concept earlier. We don't pay for how well you are. We pay because you had a blood test, because you had an x-ray, because you had a CAT scan. We don't pay for are you better. And so this is an important concept. And we'll, our attitude about it is where the government should lead, lead, and that's in Medicare payments. And when we change Medicare payments, many other payers follow. Uh, make sure we assist where we can, help and support, mm -hmm. and then get out of the way. And so this payment change is occurring in the government, uh, in our systems, but it's also occurring in the private sector. Uh, on, on the issue of payments, sort of tangentially, this idea, uh, which is borne out in reality, of rising premiums. Uh, they are going up, sometimes by a lot. Uh, premiums go up, people don't pay, they get skimpier coverage by choosing uh, less effective plans, and then they have overall poorer health. Seems to me that this is fundamental to, to this system working, right? Having premiums that people can afford. What are you going to do about that? So 20 million more Americans have coverage yes, than do. had before. And so affordability, we know, was one of the critical path issues. So for those 20 million, something has happened and something has changed and, and they have that coverage uh, now. And so with regard to that issue, I think we are making progress. Mm -hmm. As I've said, more needs to be made. The rise in premiums that we're talking about and whether it's in the marketplace, which remember, the marketplace is 10 million. You know, that's what my estimates are for what it would be at the end of this year. In the rest of the entire system, which includes employer-based coverage, Medicare, there are all those premiums as well. And what we know is over the period of time since the act has been passed, that there's actually been slower premium growth. It's still growing. And that's what people feel. And people feel that. And mm -hmm. that's, for them, that's difficult. And we know and understand. And that's why we're so focused on doing more mm -hmm. to create that downward pressure. And it involves things like high-cost drugs and some of the proposals we have, and whether that's giving HHS the ability to negotiate over uh, a class of specialty high-cost drugs, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's creating more transparency, which the Affordable Care Act gave us. And so now, actually, every year, you can actually go to our website, and you can find out what are the drugs that are receiving the most Medicare dollars. You can actually go online and find out who are the doctors and providers that are receiving the largest Medicare payments. And so that transparency is also a part of the downward pressure. You grow up in West Virginia wanting this job? Is that what happened? How did you wind up doing this? <laughs> you know, I don't know. Oh. Uh, in terms of, it is an interesting thing because I actually have never, um, in my career, kind of thought about a, a path and a trajectory. I, once when I was, uh, I just returned from Oxford and um, was offered a job that I thought sounded really neat and interesting. And I called a mentor, and and he said he was trying to be polite about this is this, a bad idea and you shouldn't do it. Um, and what he said, he told me three things. He said, if you can learn, if you can contribute, and if you can have fun in whatever you're doing, he's like you're going to put together a good career. Hmm. And I think that's been good guidance as I've gone forward, because I never would have expected that I would have gone to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I certainly wouldn't have expected that I would end up at Walmart. I never, you know, yeah. these steps I have, I have, would have never mapped this out. Are you having fun in this job? Yes. It is difficult, but it is fun. It is incredibly um, 
rewarding to be a part of trying to serve the American people in fundamental change in healthcare, in working on the very challenging issues like Zika, in working with the National Institutes of Health. It's so exciting where we're going with precision medicine. The idea that there's going to be individualized medicine. Mm -hmm. Medicine that will, you know, understand your genetics and understand actually your environmental things. You know, how much do you work out? What do you eat? All those things. And that then you will be treated as an individual with regard to your health care. Every day at HHS there is something that is incredibly exciting, but I would not be truthful if I did not say it is hard every day. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Zika, actually, uh, and we were talking downstairs before we came up. Um, it is coming. It is Lo here. Local infection is coming, you believe? Yes. Yes. Um, how prepared are you, are we, for another Ebola thing? I mean, is that what we're looking at with people in suits and the whole deal? So Zika is a little different, yeah. but has its own very difficult, unique challenges. So this is the first time that we've ever seen a mosquito-borne disease that will cause birth defects. And the birth defects are very severe. The microcephaly is extremely severe. And we do not know enough to know if there are other damaging effects. In other words, if the babies that look OK when they're born have neurological damage, hearing, sight, and developmental issues. So we don't know the answers to that. So number one, mosquito-borne birth defects. Number two, sexual transmission. This is the first time that this kind of mosquito-borne illness can be passed. And obviously, you can put together the issues of impregnation and transferring the disease uh, at the same time. The third thing is because 75 to 80% of people aren't symptomatic, it's very hard to know. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very tough, and then the last thing I would add is the mosquito itself, the vector. Um, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus are the two mosquitoes. Aegypti is the one that spreads it more quickly. It's a tough mosquito. It'll breed in a cap full of this water. And so it is extremely challenging, but what are we doing? First of all, focus on pregnant women and women getting pregnant. That has to be our focus as a nation and with this issue. What do we need to do? We need to educate, help people understand both what are the symptoms of the disease. Everybody here should know because everybody should watch for it this summer. One. Uh, pink eye, conjunctivitis, huh. joint pain, uh, rashes, and fever. What should you do to prevent? Four things uh, in terms of that. Number one, use EPA-approved uh, insecticides. Two, long pants, long sleeves. Three, uh, screens and air conditioning and elimination of standing water, if you have standing water around your home. We are working on diagnostics for testing to know if you have Zika. This is what the government is doing. We're working with the states to be prepared. We are investing in vaccines. And we're trying to set up the mechanism by which we will track the babies that are born to Zika women, women who have tested positive for Zika. 2,200 people in the United States right. have Zika right now. And we're over 300 pregnant women uh, in terms of the number uh, in the United States. And in Puerto Rico, there is local transmission. That means in Puerto Rico, Mosquitoes are biting people and passing it. Here in the U continental US, just travelers and when, sex. When you see people uh, saying that they're not gonna go to Rio for the Olympics because of the Zika virus, do you say, ooh, overreaction or ooh, smart? Um, what I say is, are you pregnant? <laughs> Um, because that is the big issue. And so for women who are pregnant, yeah. we are clear with our travel recommendations. You should not go to the 48 countries and territories where there is local transmission of Zika because of the, the yeah. risk involved. For others, what you want to do is make sure that you understand how to protect yourself while there, as well as protecting yourself when you come back. So three weeks for all of you that may be traveling to those countries, even if you're not childbearing years or other issues, when you come back for three years, you should protect yourself against mosquito bites here because you don't want to be the person that causes local transmission in the United States and the continental US. Um, continuing with this theme of public health, which is a, a large part of what you do uh, entirely apart from the ACA, we were talking again downstairs about Flint Mm -hmm. and the public health ramifications of what's going on there and, mm -hmm. and Medicaid enrollment and all of that stuff. And you mentioned almost in passing that you had gotten a call one day that said, oh yeah, HHS is the lead agency for Flint, ready, go. Um, how does that happen? Who decides, you? Sylvia, you're it, tag. 
Um, those are decisions that come from the White House uh, ah. and uh, the President in terms of what agency will be the lead agency for different issues that we face when they come up. And so this is one that we were asked to do um, uh, by the White House and the President. And so we have taken on that responsibility. And what it means to be the lead agency means that we coordinate across the federal mm -hmm. government and that we are the point in terms of coordinating uh, overall with the state and local governments. Mm -hmm. So we sent teams in, and teams also came from across the government. EPA, uh, FEMA was there very early on, our USDA colleagues, and we set up uh, what you would consider a, a control center with everyone in it uh, to work on the issues together with the community in Flint. Do you, um, just to get back to where I started, which is you running this ginormous bureaucracy in a, in a deeply political environment. Do we have to keep calling it a bureaucracy? Well, I mean, it kind of is. $1.1 trillion of anything is a ginormous bureaucracy. All right, organization, a fast functioning organization. Um, uh, this is a very subjective question, which I think your consultant mind will have a hard time with, um, which I think you would admit, right? You have a consultant's mind. We were talking downstairs. Um, what's your frustration level? Um, it varies on different days and on various things in terms of the frustration level. But the one thing that you kind of have to do these jobs with is the attitude that you know you're given what you're given, you know, yeah. in terms of you know whether it's the issue that you described in terms of the politicized, you know, the politicized ACA. You 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 have the environment you have, um, and so what you've got to do is you know spending emotional energy on that versus like okay how do we move. How do we move? It just, you really have to do that because otherwise it will be a very frustrating and a, and a much more negative experience versus like getting in there and going, okay, so this is what we have, so what do we do? Where are we going and what do we do to get there? Right. And leading the team in that way because you can imagine my frustrations are the team's frustrations mm -hmm. and all the people that I work with. And so it's very important for me to keep maintaining a, okay, mm -hmm. If we got a door just closed in our face, hmm. where's the window? Hmm. Let's figure out the window. You know, what's the window? Let's take a step back. Do we write, have the right objectives? Are we trying mm -hmm. to achieve the right outcomes? And if so, okay, then let's look for the window. And so, because there are frustrating elements. Yeah. Uh, you, before uh, you came to HHS, you were running uh, OMB, the Office of Management and Budget for the, for the president. Um, what is it like uh, running the budget for the federal government? Um, it's great in this that, sense. That can't be true. In this sense. I'm going to go to what's bad about right, it. But, okay. uh, and what's great is you can just see the breadth and depth of what's occurring across uh, the entire federal government. And remembering that OMB is also the M. Most people, you focus mm -hmm. on the B, but mm -hmm. the M is actually an important um, part of it. And one of the exciting things that happened that was started when I was there and finished after I left is the U.S. Digital Services. Uh, which I don't is, even know what that is. It is an exciting um, thing that is the creation of a unit at the Office of Management and Budget that brings in technology experts from all over the country that come in and will serve for limited times in government so that what we can do is use the best technology minds in the country working on technology and government. And so those are some of the things that are great about OMB. Some of the things that are not so great about OMB, my first day after I was confirmed was the first day, um, that point sequest sequester had gone in and the entire OMB team was furloughed. So you come to work and your team's not there because there's that. I mean, another great, and this is a crossover between your frustration question mm -hmm. and what's not great. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, if you look it up, the person who shut down the federal government, that memo, that was me. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, that was a very difficult time and a very difficult thing. Trying to run the federal government when it's shut down. Yeah. I mean, there are many important things that are happening every day that people demand and need. Uh, everything from, you know, the services of the government that are just not going to be provided if you're shut down. And so those are some of the things that I would put in the tough category. Do you find uh, that the allure of government service is an effective recruiting tool as you try to get people to come in and work with you at a high level? I think um, that serving the country is, that is what you are um, recruiting with and mm -hmm. that's what you do recruit with. 
I will tell you it becomes harder and harder. And I'll give you some examples of why that becomes harder. Right now, and I think you'll understand, the department's a large one. I don't have a confirmed deputy secretary in a place that's as large as not confirmed. I, don't have a, I haven't had a confirmed administrator for children and families. That runs all of the refugee, the unaccompanied children, TANF, which used to be welfare, Head Start programs at HHS, and I don't have a confirmed head of it. I don't have a confirmed head of the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Health. So you ask these people to mm -hmm. come, and I ask, you, I ask you, will you please give up your career yeah. and come because I think you're, you know, we think you're going to be a terrific X or Y. And then, you know, this process. And so, and then the oversight. When the oversight is fair, people understand and appreciate it. But often, that process is a very difficult, arduous one that sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. has elements to it uh, that perhaps are more difficult than not. And so those are the things that push back against that very important attraction of, like, serving the American people. And so I do believe uh, it is hard, mm -hmm. and the recruiting is hard. Uh, let me circle back to the ACA here for a bit, and then uh, we'll open it up to questions. Uh, let's just do me a favor and keep them questions. We'll save the speeches for afterwards. Um, you all know what I mean, right? Come on. Um, you have six months left. Uh, and I think 24 days. And 24 days, but who's counting? Um, you are going to be actually in the middle of an open enrollment period for the Affordable Care Act mm -hmm. uh, on the 20th of January. Um, Will you uh, be able to get everything done that you want to get done by then? You, you Sylvia Burwell, not you, healthcare for the masses. Um, you know, I will always want to do more. Hmm. So the answer to that is no. Hmm. But uh, you know, we're on a path to aggressively do as much as we can get done. But of course, I, you know, you're always going to want to do more. It's like anything in life. You know, you you set out and you see, you do, and then you realize, oh gosh, we could get this done or get that done. But with regard to the open enrollment, it will, you know, it will go on. It will yeah. be fine. You know, the important date, a very important date, will be December 15th because those that sign up on December 15th get coverage January 1st. And you want to get people on that one-year cycle uh, of coverage. Uh, and that's something we're moving to, to move the deadlines back over a period of time. But um, no, I'll always want to do more. Yeah. Uh, speaking of doing more, what are you going to do on January 21st? On January 21st, I am going to either ride the scooters or our bikes with <laughs> our eight-year-old and our six-year-old mm. to school. I will take my children to school for the first time since I've been in Washington, D.C. on January 21st, 2017. That will be what I will do. This is a little bit out of left field, but um, uh -oh. you do enough research on, on Sylvia Burwell, oh, no. and you discover that a lot of people thought you were going to uh, run for the governor of West Virginia one day. You're going to be out of a job in six months and 24 days. What are you doing, uh, what are you doing in 2018? <laughs> not that. Not, not that? that? Not that. I, I, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, I, my, uh, you know, the current governor right now, I'm sure everyone knows about the flooding in West yeah, Virginia and flood. the difficult, you know, economically difficult in my yeah. home state. I do go home a lot, love my home state, and right now just really, really suffering. The floods, 44 of our 55 counties have been declared an emergency, and the damage is incredible. On Friday, I had to call my mother every hour because my mother, who was 81, refused to leave as the river, you know, came out of the riverbanks, crossed the road. She's like, I moved the car to the back. I'm like, well, that's good because the driveway's blocked from the pictures you're showing. Um, yeah. But no, um, you know, right now, the big thing I'm focused on is finish out, get everything I can to get done, and then spend some time with the family. Describe for me the difference in the American healthcare market between 2010 and today. So three places it's different. Uh, it, with regard to access, the access that people have to affordable health care has changed dramatically. And with regard to quality, the quality of the offering is dramatically different for everyone, not just for people in the marketplace. The pre-ex, all those things that I went over, that is fundamentally different. And it's enhanced by other things like a reduction in readmissions. There's been a reduction of 565,000 readmissions into hospitals, and those were tools that were passed in the Affordable Care Act. And then the last place is actually in affordability. And while 
premiums continue to rise, it has been tamped down. And so those are fundamental changes that are going to go on and continue and be built on. And then there is this big change, which is that consumer at the center where we're going to pay for the outcomes, where you're going to have better coordinated care and more prevention and wellness, and the data and information in the healthcare system will be used better. The thing you haven't talked about with that consumer, though, because healthcare is bewildering. And much like you have to deal with your mom in the driveway, and I'm sure her healthcare, so too do we all have to deal with, you know, my mom going to the doctor and being confused and all that jazz. Where's the education? Where's the thing that's going to make that consumer actually smarter as opposed to the system getting smarter around her? So part of that is in what the consumer is demanding and meeting what the consumer is demanding. One of the things we announced uh, uh, about a month and a half ago was a bill you can understand. Hmm. And so hmm. we actually are doing a competition. Uh, you know, actually, you know, this is going out and sourcing for a bill you can understand. A, a medical bill, a hospital doctor's bill, right? Yes, and yeah. your insurance bill. Yeah. You know, I, I, that thing that everybody gets called explanation of benefits, it's as hard as, for me as it is for you. And so, you know, things like that and actions like that, creating the tools, the consumer demanded the tools in the marketplace that didn't exist. And right now when you go to, the, if you are a person who's gonna shop on the marketplace, you can try and figure out if your provider is in that insurance plan mm -hmm. or will it cover your drugs? And creating tools like that for the consumer, how do we connect to the consumer? Mm -hmm. It's understanding what they need and then trying to meet those needs. And the other thing is forcing things that are consumer friendly, like for your mother, I don't know if your mother's had the knee replacement or the no, hip replacement, but when she does, um, the issue of a bundled payment, yeah. by, what a bundled payment is, is you pay for the episode of care. So from the moment that person walks into her home and tells her, okay, put the dishes down here, because when you get home, you gotta have the dishes here because you can't reach. <laughs> that rug has to go because when you're kind of still at a place where you're not lifting, get all those rugs to the point of the anesthesiologist, to the physical therapist, they'll be paid together. And they're gonna be paid for her success. So if you're the anesthesiologist, you're kind of interested in me, the physical therapist, doing my job right, because your payment is related to that. And so doing things like that that are more consumer-centric but we have to help the consumer understand and listen to them. And that's one of the most important parts of this cycle is consumer engagement. All right, so let's open it up for Secretary Burwell. Uh, there's a microphone over there. We're gonna kind of go bing binging across the room. So first one with the hand up near the guy with the mic gets the first question. Yes, no, maybe? There we go. Good evening. Um, I'm gonna caption my question first, is there enough? And what I mean by that is, um, you are very much involved, as you explained, with OMB, and now with HHS. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the total healthcare bill in the country is about $3 trillion. So my question there, then, is, is there enough, if we had a single-payer system, within that number of $3 trillion to cover everything, including the $1.1 trillion that, that the government now does and, and the rest that we all pay either through health, uh, through, through workplace or personally. So is there enough? So I think um, uh, the question in terms of whatever system that you have, uh, the system that we currently work in or other systems, I think the question of three trillion, is it enough, is the same question no matter what payment system um, that you uh, can use, uh, can you use different ones to get there? And I think the answer to that is most likely, yes, and we just have to transition to a place, and that's why I'm so, you hear me keep talking about these changes that we need to make, because we need to have that downward pressure on, afford, you know, get the affordability better, cost down, and the other part up. So I think that we can, as a nation, uh, get there, and I sure. do believe that. The one thing that I think isn't accounted for in the number is the demographic change that we face as a nation. And when people talk about healthcare costs, you know, why you heard me cite per capita statistics is we have an issue as a nation, which is we are moving the baby boom through, and that in and of itself. So I would want to run the numbers on what you just said uh, with the demographic shift. So, so let me follow up on you saying most likely, and I think we can. Mm -hmm. Let me get a little Rumsfeldian on you here. Yes. What are the unknown unknowns? What are you worried about? What I'm worried about is the changes in the system that we're talking about in terms of um, some of the reforms that we're talking about. Like right now, 
we have a proposal on a very technical thing. It has to do with Part B of Medicare and how we pay on drugs. And we've put forward this proposal, and there's been pushback um, and strong pushback from the pharmaceutical industry and others. And so when you ask me what I worry about is changes are going to have to occur. And when those changes occur, in order for the amount of money to meet the needs, that means there are going to be changes. And people are going to have to think about their business differently uh, and in different ways. And I think that is a place where, if you ask me where I think there's going to be pushback and difficulty, I think that uh, is true. Let's work our way around here. We'll get you in the front, and then we'll, and then we'll go to the back. Thank you. It's a great conversation. Um, the National Institute of Health estimates that over a third of U.S. adults are obese. And uh, studies such as from, as from Harvard have indicated that over around $200 billion is attributed to healthcare costs as a result of obesity. You know, it's pretty clear that as a global society with our food system that we are essentially are poisoning ourselves. And this kind of touches to your earlier point about uh, treatment versus prevention. But what are you doing? What can be done? And, um, you know, what are your thoughts just personally about it? There, there's a lot in there. So a lot in there. a lot in there. And one of the <clears throat> things is creating a payment system that supports prevention and wellness, which is one of the things that has been done and why when we talk about rolling back or repealing the ACA, mm -hmm. I don't think people want to go back. Because I think most people are actually interested in the prevention and wellness pieces. In the payment space also, so the Affordable Care Act gave authorities for the department, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, to do models and create models. We, for the first time this year, have the first time a preventative model that will be scored by our actuaries. You know, the actuaries that are modeling everything. Okay, you're very it's excited in about that. Why does that matter? Why it matters is because then we can scale it, and it is on diabetes. And so we did a program <clears throat> with the YMCA and Medicare patients. And what we found was a program of education and tools helped pre-diabetic Medicare uh, recipients stay out, and they have lost 5% of their body weight, hmm. and the average savings per year was $2,600 relating to the gentleman's question about three million, mm -hmm. the, the three, $3 trillion, trillion back there. And so getting those models, the actuarial uh, soundness of it means that we can move to scale it. That's what it took for us to move to scale. Then the other side, so that's the payment side of the house. The public health side of the house is very important too. And recently we put out, uh, out of FDA, voluntary uh, goals for sodium reduction. Right. We also, you know, in terms of, you didn't mention this as one of the issues, you mentioned obesity, but tobacco in our country kills 500,000 people a year. That's just tobacco. And so I think you probably saw recently that we deemed or made equal e-cigarettes, cigars, hookah, and other uh, products uh, that have tobacco. And so there are steps that we can do on the public health. The other one I would just mention is out of CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. We have a, a million hearts effort that tells you about the basics of heart uh, heart health, and I would encourage everyone who hasn't been to the Mount Sinai thing mm -hmm. to go, find out your cholesterol, find out your blood pressure, find out your BMI. Hmm. Let's go in the back. Somebody. Anybody in the back? Got a mic in the back. It's going unused right there. Nothing worse than an unused mic. You mentioned that um, in terms of what's left to be done with uh, ACA, that it, you can't even get there because there's not the dialogue to have it. Is that dialogue possible under these conditions? And if so, what would spark the conditions for actually having a constructive dialogue about the next steps of it? So um, I think that the dialogue is possible in a, in a, a space. And it is a place where actually uh, on the Hill, I hosted a bipartisan, bicameral meeting on, you know, so House, Senate, Republicans, Democrats, on these issues of reforming the healthcare system. And so that is the entry point in, um, I think, to the conversation about a portion of this. And I think that the other conversation, I'm hopeful, will evolve over time. And it does occur in certain places. I mean, I have done Medicaid expansions with Republican governors. 
And so you can get some traction in some places. And we've seen a number of Republican governors, South Dakota, Utah, Tennessee, pushing on those issues. Uh, so I think there are spaces for that conversation to occur. Some of it, though, you know, continues to be challenging. But what I kind of believe is build the muscles in the places where you can, and then try the harder issues. Let's work the left side of the room, shall we? There we go. Hi, Madam Secretary. My name is Celeste Amidon, and I know that due to Supreme Court rulings, an employer is now able to legally deny a woman contraceptive and abortion coverage with their insurance um, due to if they have a religious exemption. How do you see this evolving in the future? So um, in the contraception space, thanks for your question, and a very important issue, because the issue highlights two very important things in our nation, um, respect for religious beliefs, as well as a woman's ability to access the health care she needs. And your question kind of uh, bridges uh, two different things. There's the Hobby Lobby versus Burwell decision. And no, the president didn't tell me the court case has changed to my name, King versus Burwell, House versus Burwell, didn't tell me that. And that is a decision that said a company could do this. Uh, and then there were recent decisions by the Supreme Court, um, Zubik versus Burwell, uh, that had to do with uh, entities that are religiously affiliated. But at the root of the issue is figuring out a way, and, and we think we have proposed a way, that uh, the entity does not have to do anything that would be oppositional to their religious beliefs, but that the women can get the health care they need. And so the most recent court decision, which is the Zubik decision, which was a 4-4 decision because of our Supreme Court situation right now, um, said, go forward with the way you're doing it, have some conversations, and figure out if you can figure out another way. Uh, and so we'll continue. It doesn't affect the policies we're doing to make sure we try and have women who work for institutions that don't want to provide, that they have an opportunity to get the health care that they need, but that those institutions don't have to express themselves in ways that they believe are against their religious beliefs. So a tough space. Uh, but one that we think we have a solution that works. Yeah, really good and important question. Let's keep going on that way, and then we'll work around the back. Um, this is another question on insurance. Um, for a lot of people today, insurance is a high deductible health care plan, and that's the trade off where you have perhaps lower premiums with a, a higher deductible. But a lot of people who have the high deductible plans, um, what they find is they're not using the health care. They're, it's not that they're shopping more smartly, but they don't have the money they can't afford to get to the deductible. So with a growing number of people having high deductible health care plans, and that might be their only choice, what do you think about high deductible health care plans, and how can people make them work? So um, I would distinguish in two different places. Um, uh, I would distinguish between employer-based plans that have high deductibility and it plans in the marketplace uh, that have high deductibility. And, um, in the marketplace, uh, the 10 million that we were, were talking about, with regard to uh, some of the things that I think are important there is there are limits on your out-of-pocket costs, and that's for everyone. And so that helps a little bit uh, with you know, some of these issues. But I think what's important in the marketplace is the concept of shopping. And that may be easier or harder, but in employer base, there may not be as many opportunities for that. There may be. But shopping and making sure you find the plan that works for you and your, your uh, approach. The other thing is, in the marketplace, uh, we studied the plans. And eight out of 10 of the plans that people are purchasing actually have quite a few services before you engage in deductibility. So making sure you know and understand that is an important part of it. Finally, in terms of the deductibility issue, one of the things is consumers are making choices based on price. Uh, and price interacts with two things, generally speaking. Price being premiums. It often interacts with deductibility. And the other thing it interacts with is the network and how broad the network is. And so whether it's an employer plan or marketplace plans that the private sector are offering, they're responding to how the consumer is making choices. The thing that I think is most important, and we worked very hard in the second and third year of the marketplace, is to educate the consumer. Because many people who were getting insurance for the first time 
didn't know or understand the deductibility issue, and it was prohibitive to people getting access to care that they needed. And so making sure that when people are making decisions, that they understand the decision they're making becomes very important. And what is amazing that is in the marketplace, 70% of the people that had enrolled the year before came back shocked. And so it's a very active and engaged consumer, much more. If I asked you all in the employer-based market, for everyone who's in the employer-based market, how many of you went in and changed your plan last year? The number will be, a, a, it's very low. It's generally 10% or lower. It's generally 10% or lower. So that's where we got to spread that to the employer market. In the back corner there, yes, ma'am, with the white shirt on. I was listening uh, last week, I think it was, to Science Friday, and then we're having a discussion about the CDC division that studies injuries. Um, and the discussion was about the extent to which the CDC division that studies injuries is limited in its ability to study injuries from guns based on regulation or legislation. Can you explain that to me, please? So this has to do with the issue of, you know, when you were talking about politicized issue, the issue of guns and gun violence in terms of injury and um, our ability to have funding to do research on the issues of guns and gun violence. And so the Congress has not, uh, for a number of years, provided the resources. There was a strong effort in the last uh, budget process. Uh, there was a, a big fight that occurred between Democrats and Republicans on this issue, but we still did not get the funding. And I think that's probably what the, I'm not familiar with the piece, but I think that's what the piece most likely was about, is that we don't uh, have the funding to be able to do the type of research that we ask for funding for every year. And it's in the gun space. Right. Well, where are we? where's the microphone? There's the microphone. Yes, ma'am, right there. Perhaps, by the way, thank you. You've been really very comprehensive, and I have enjoyed it. Um, perhaps, though, where you are in Washington, you may not hear of or see the kinds of pushback that comes from insurance companies to provide testing. What can be done from up there to make it easier where we are? So understanding where those issues are occurring is very important to us because how we are able to follow up in mass is important. And so, for example, one of the places that was very difficult is actually in the contraception space because it is required to be covered, the basic types of contraception. And so that wasn't happening. And I, whether it's, um, and I do visit and go out in communities and get to spend time, and whether it was me hearing about it, or I will tell you, and I don't think she'll mind, uh, Senator Claire McCaskill's daughter couldn't get it. She was being denied, and the insurance company said, you know. And so when we hear about that, then we have to put out additional guidance to really be clear, and whether it's there or coverage of hepatitis C, you know, where there are actually drugs and treatments that are expensive but very effective. And so when we know where these cases occur, there are two different things that can be happening. One, a lack of clarity on the rules that they don't understand. And then we issue guidance and technical assistance and do that. And then two, it can become an enforcement matter. And depending on where they are or what marketplace they're in, you know, whether it's Medicare or uh, providers or uh, marketplace providers, there are different channels for enforcement matters. So it's very important for us to know. And the Office of Civil Rights and CMS, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, are the two places to go in our organization and make sure we know. Uh, actually had a call, a personal friend called me about a colonoscopy denial uh, that recently happened. And so that's did, how we started to follow up. Did they want you to fix it or what? Uh, you know what they, most of, obviously I never can get involved in single issue matters, but um, knowing that it's happening helps. Yeah. And so what it does is it leads me to learn how people do the denials, right? right? right. So this was someone who said it wasn't, a pre uh, it wasn't a preventative service. And it's like the person had just turned 50. And you know, so was it, right? So those are the kinds of things. 
Last one. Let's make it a good one. Where, do we have a question in the back there somewhere? Where do we got somebody? Anybody? Raise your hands. All right. Is there a microphone right there? Let's sit right there. Lucky winner, last question. Thank, thank you for you speaking so, up. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I think um, when the Surgeon General spoke about the importance of emotional well-being and that impact on the success and health, I think that touched a chord with so many of us. So I was wondering if you could please speak a little more about getting a higher percentage of engaged patients among everyone, the most vulnerable populations who are facing sort of the starkest cultural and social Determinants, how can we make everyone get to the point where they can feel that success? What, what incentives and what forces can make that happen? Thank you. So um, I think at its most fundamental, why the issues of access are so important, access to health insurance and basic coverage are so important, is so that people can get you know, in the door. Is it the only answer? Is it the uh, most, but it is the most fundamental and the most important. And so the poor, uh, populations that have disproportionate health issues, and whether that's the African American population, the Latino population, the LGBT population, we have seen dramatic reductions in their uninsured rates as part of that 20 million. And I think that's step one. I think many of the things that the Surgeon General was speaking to um, are important educational issues and are important across all populations, both those um, that are underserved and struggle from some of the most difficult health issues in our nation to those who just are not recognizing and realizing the importance of this broad spectrum of issues. And that's why you've heard me say time and time again, prevention uh, and wellness are critical path issues as we go forward. I think we're done. Madam Secretary, thank you for your time. Thank you all, all right, for your time. You. Thank you.